So uh, I spent the whole day studying uh, books on thermodynamics and um, specifically entropy um, and the second law of thermodynamics. And um, most of these books are pretty uh, technical mathematically, and I, I'm in no sense of the word competent in uh, what they call mathematics. So I was skipping over those parts, really, which is most of the book. And, you know, for an engineer or a physicist, um, for me to even be trying to understand entropy independently of the mathematics, um, which really are um, measurements and predictions for experiments, um, I don't really understand, and I have no chance of understanding um, thermodynamics, which may be true, but um, I'm trying to understand it conceptually, I'm trying to understand what it is supposed to say about nature, um, mostly what it's supposed to say about living creatures like you and I and um, many other creatures. Because, you know, you would think, or at least in the 19th and early 20th century, they used to think that there was this contradiction between uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which says basically that uh, given enough time, everything returns to equilibrium, or in other words, everything falls apart, returns to the flat line, um, complete disorder and chaos. Um, which, which isn't actually true of the second law. Um, you know, there's a quantum physicist, uh, strangely enough, in one of my metaphysics classes, and, um, I spoke to him about entropy today, and he says it's kind of a misnomer to call it, um, a trend toward disorder, because actually, if you look at the distribution pattern, and you, you sort of plot it out on a graph, um, the distribution pattern of objects in a container over time, um, you will see a certain order to it. Um, and he was, he gave me the example specifically of, uh, just, you know, think of a box, um, with a partition you can slide into it, and, uh, you know, you have, we'll start with one ball, you throw a ball in there, you put the partition through, um, and let's say you know you don't hit the, the ball, but it's on one of the two sides. W what's the chance that it's on the left? Well, fifty percent, right? Um, now throw another ball in there, so you have two balls total. Put the partition in. Um, what are the chances that you have both balls on the left? It's twenty-five percent, right? And twenty-five percent for both balls on the right. One ball on each side. That's fifty percent. So you can see there's kind of a distribution curve with, with a hump in the middle where it's more likely for there to be two balls on each side than for there to be one or both balls on one side. So an order arises from what is supposed to be a measure of, of disorder, of a loss in complexity. And, you know, it's interesting because when you think of, of the second law of thermodynamics in terms of information theory, which Claude Shannon invented trying to figure out how to send information through wires for telephone companies, um, you basically get the same sort of um, contradictory result in the sense that some people say that when entropy in increases in a container, uh, it's a decrease in information because it's a trend towards equilibrium or towards a maximal state of uh, redundancy. So you're losing information, right? But then other people would look at the same container and say, well, actually, no, there's more information uh, when entropy increases. Um, you're getting a more uh, distributed system. Um, in other words, to know that system you, you, you have to say something very specific. You have to get the fine details. To know something about a system far from equilibrium, say, um, you know, both balls landing on the left, which, let's, let's say we were dealing with 
ten thousand balls, and all ten thousand landed on the left. So you, it's a little more, it's a little less likely. Um, we would care. We could characterize that easier than we could characterize accurately um, a state of equilibrium where there were, you know. 4,652 on that side and 5,500 and whatever on the other side. To really, to really know that one, we would have to count each individually. But, you know, if, if they're all on the left, it's like, oh, it's, it's just all on. It's a one instead of a zero. Um, but either way, you could, you could interpret either a rise in entropy or lowering of entropy in a system as a gain in information. It, it just depends what kind of questions you want to ask about that system. So in information theory there's this same um, conflict kind of um, paradox you could say about about the law. Um, and see you know the thing is that most of our experience at least here on this planet has nothing to do with entropy because well you know it's something to do with it but um, entropy is is a is a law derived from the operation of uh, closed systems or mechanical systems of some kind um, very simple setups in other words most systems though most thermodynamic systems are open our planet for example what we actually and all of life uh, exists on, you know, this is planets all where the action goes on apparently in our universe. I mean, yeah, black holes are kind of cool, but you can't like go up to one and check it out. You know, you if you do, you're you're in it. You're lost in eternity apparently. Um, although Stephen Hawking supposedly has proven that there is information leaking out of uh, of black holes, so something is escaping. Um, but I don't know what that means really. The point is, the action happens on planets like, like Earth, where because there's an open system, there's an exchange of energy, you know, light coming from the sun, um, being absorbed and reflecting off of the planet's surface. And, and you can imagine, right after the planet cooled down and comets start raining down on its surface, depositing water and it, it forms a, a rather large ocean um, with maybe a few small volcanic islands uh, dotted across its surface and um, somehow because a gradient has built up um, between the tremendous heat coming from the sun um, and the uh, chill of, of, of empty space I think it's like 3,000 Kelvin uh, from the sun and um, like 1.7 Kelvin uh, or 3 Kelvin or something like that. That's the difference we're talking about in, in space. So there's a tremendous amount of um, energy moving into and out of the earth. So it's kind of like it was charging up um, the oceans with this, this negative energy, this neg entropy. Um, this exchange of information, um, this increase in complexity. You know, if it was just empty space, you wouldn't even see light. It would be invisible. But as soon as you have matter, light can see itself. And by seeing itself, it rises into um, a higher state of vibration, quite literally. And these vibrational energies um, gather up molecules on the surface, that this, this just emerges on the surface, that these molecules, because of the light and the energy gradient, gather themselves up into, into cells, um, into self-producing molecules, collections of molecules that are self-producing, but really, uh, you know, you think of this, this level of organization of atoms, it seems to happen at every level. There's, you know, atoms at the microscopic level, there are planets at the uh, macroscopic level, and on planets there are cells and bodies, units of, of expression. It seems to be how the universe breaks down. But uh, I'll make a part two, I think.